Um, well, firstly, um, how did growing up as a preacher's son contribute um, to your self-awareness? Well, I didn't grow up uh -huh. thinking that I would become a poet. In fact, uh, I started writing rhymes at a young age. Mm -hmm. um, I was, all, I was rapping from like the age of eight or nine. Um, what my father, my father instilled a few things. One, now he would always talk about the power of the word, but when he said the word, he meant the Bible. Right. At a really young age, it was kind of clear to me that the power of the word was not just what was in the Bible. I remember having little Jewish friends and the Buddhist friends and being like, come on, Dad this little girl is doing unto others as she would have them do unto her. She even gave me her snack yesterday. Is she going to hell because she hasn't accepted? You know, like, <laughs> you know? I always, uh, I guess, had to think in terms of what my calling was. And that had me looking at life and my relationship to my art a bit differently. Because it, it, it shifted from what I wanted to do to what it was that I'm meant to do. You know, believing that, you know, you were created for a particular purpose, you know, which inherent in that belief would be a belief in an innermost power or a creative power or creator or power, or however you want to term it. Um, that is probably the, the biggest influence of having a, a minister as a dad. His friends were all ministers and they would know those are the first people like in relation to hip-hop the ministers were the first people that I ever saw with you know Cadillacs, rims, wow. gold rims, <laughs> you know, rings, you know uh, hats tilted, you know medallions they they had that before the rappers did mm -hmm. you know they the rappers got that stuff because there used to be a time in the community the only people that would have that type of stuff would be the ministers then later on, it became the ministers and the pimps, you know, and then it became the rappers. Because they had the money. You know? And then you hear the rappers aligning themselves with the pimps. I would see my dad and these guys critiquing other ministers and, 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 and like, not only critiquing, but more so, not critiquing, more so complimenting. Like, you know, like they had ways of leaning on the pulpit. There was a point in the sermon that was the perfect point for the musician to come in, you know, and start to accompany him with what he spoke and if you know and every minister would pride themselves on how they would ride that beat and the laws you know like they would plan these things you know and then they would go back to a restaurant afterwards and be like oh my god they had them on their feet when it got to that point oh it was crazy and other minister would be like yo when you did that i stood up and you know like so you know and that's the same way that me and my friends would be like, yo, did you hear when KRS one said, you know, like it was the same sort of thing. And so growing up in the church also exposed me to the art of oration, you know, and how, but in a, in a, in a pure type of sense, because as much as these guys critiqued each other and what have you, they weren't hypocrites. They believed in the power of the word and the Bible and of God and all this stuff, and they believed that they were being spoken through, but they also were well aware that they were all different vessels or filters you find in my work. Like granted, I'm, I'm very familiar with the Bible, but if we're talking about the Bible, we're not talking about necessarily spirituality. We're talking about a book that has been used through a religion. If we're talking about religion, we're still not really talking too much about spirituality usually talking about something we're born into that you're afraid to question, you know, if there's a big difference, you know. And so when I think of what I got from the church, I think of the fear. I think of the fact that, you know, mm -hmm. I was afraid to question stuff because I thought if I did, I'd be going to hell. That voice from nowhere, mm -hmm. that burning bush, that passing up, I heard the voices of generals calling for ammunition, presidents calling for arms, and women calling for help. Where is that voice from nowhere, that God of Abraham? Can he be heard over the gunfire, the whiz of passing missiles, the crash of buildings, the cries of children, the crack of bones, the shriek of silence? Or is that his mighty voice, your angry God craving the sacrifice of virgin generation? 
ranching suns to generate, your holy books written in ready on burning sands, your prayers between rounds do no more than fasten the fate of your children to the hammer truth of your trigger, a truth that mushrooms its dark and cloud the rest of us so that we too bear witness to the short-lived fate of a civilization that worships a male god. Your weapons are phallic, all of them. That dummy that um, I see you as a person who has gone beyond racial barriers and you have a very large following outside of the african-american population why do you think that is and in your work um, is there a time when race is important to you and when it is not i think that the learning process has to always be coupled with the unlearning process in order for it to work mm -hmm. i think that uh, the reason why my work might cross the racial divide is because I don't believe in the racial divide. I know that as black and proud as I can be, you know, there still is no such thing as race. Where should we start? Should we start with the fact that race is a myth? Or is that... Uh, if the state has been this way, and you want it to stand center, you don't just push it to center, you have to push it to the opposite extreme. So from racial inferiority, to black pride and black power, it, it becomes a necessity. But at the end of the day, we realize that our spirits and souls are not, you know, they have no true connection to the idea of race, you know, and that race is a social construct, you know, that there's nothing scientifically to prove any theory of race, but we buy into it as part of our self-identity crisis. Um, <laughs> Then it begins, huh? Gender is, is a little different because there is something scientific. As much, and none of us are probably as much purely ourselves as we think, but we cling to these definitions of, of race and what have you because they actually mean something to us more than we'd like to admit at times, you know? Um, but anyway, I guess, I, I, my work crosses a racial divide because I don't see it as a divide, or I, I know that divide is man-made, just like the one between religions. Right. I, I think that, uh, I mean, we live in, a, in an age where perhaps we're closer to a time where we can talk about that, you know? Like, it would be inappropriate for me in 1965 to be like, race doesn't matter, you know? <laughs> Because where we were in the struggle right then, like we had to get to the point of saying black is beautiful. Like you can't say race doesn't matter before you get to the point of black being beautiful. Yeah. You know, the learning, the unlearn, like it has to balance out before you get to the point of stepping beyond it. You know, so. Do you think we've reached that point? It's an individual journey. Where do you stand with when you're actually on stage? and you're reciting your poetry, what do you think that you want your audience to take away from it? Like, is there a certain message that comes with every poem or is everything different? Or is there an overall journey you want your audience to take with you through your poems? I don't think of the audience really. Um, and I don't think of myself as like performing poems. I think of myself as reciting stuff that I've written before. I mean, first off, it's important to remember that the oral history of poetry is much longer than the written history of poetry. You know, not even Homer. The Greeks didn't read Homer in his day. They were illiterate. People gathered to hear him speak. He was a spoken word artist. You know, the troubadours of, of Europe, the griots of West Africa, Lao Tzu and Kabir, whoever else in the East, Hafiz in the Middle East. His name means one who records at 12th century Persia. People gathered to hear these people speak because the majority of people were illiterate, you know? So that poetry as a written art form is, is pretty new and pretty Western, you know? But this is something like, so that the excitement surrounding the whole thing that's happening with poetry first off is, for me, it's not because it's new, but it's more so that in the face of all these laptops and, and cell phones and all this stuff that we've started to turn towards something ancient. My background's in acting. And so I've, I've had to consider the audience a great deal. Poetry is freeing for me because I don't have to. 
you know, also as far as performance is concerned, for people who don't come from theater, when they go on stage to read their poems, they feel like they have to perform. To me, the essence of performance is presence. When it mm -hmm. comes to, you know, you think of a James Earl Jones or whatever, it's not because of what he puts on. Yeah. It's because he doesn't have to put anything on. He just walks up and goes, what a strong presence. Well, what is presence? Presence is being, right? Present, mm -hmm. I'm here, being. You know, so that by studying another character, you come to the pro through the process of essentially studying yourself. You know, and and and, and essentially by doing all, you, you travel. It's not about what you put on. It's a, it's about essentially how much of yourself you're comfortable bringing to the stage. Mm -hmm. Simply, at that point, it's not about the audience. It's about how much of yourself you bring into the stage. Simply. Mother Nature's a horror, said the shotgun to the head, mm. and it smelled like teen spirit, mm. angst-driven, insecure, a country in puberty, a country at war. Yeah. The greatest Americans <clears throat> have not been born yet. They are waiting patiently for the past to die. Do you feel as a poet it's um, your role or your calling, say, to convey the truth? I think that, uh, who was it? Um, I think it was Keats who said that the, the role of the artist is to bring about a greater sense of, or a heightened sense of truth and beauty. Um, I don't have any problem with that. I think that's, I think that's pretty much all art forms. Um, you know about Nas saying hip hop is dead. Do you have any feelings about that statement? Well, I think that uh, you know Nas doesn't mean that it's dead. First, even on that album, you know, like that last song talks about it's not really dead. I think the death of hip hop is shamanic, you know, um, and the idea of. something has died within us, you know, so that we have to, something has to be reborn. That we're all, you know, we're also very critical of hip hop in this, in its early phases in a, in a very silly way, like it's, it's very arrogant of us to think that it would be born and die, you know, like in our lifetime. Like if you look at hip hop on a jazz timeline, we're 35 years into it, which is to say that we're at the point of swing, which is to say that we're 20 years from a bird a Dizzy, a Coltrane, a Miles, a Thelonious Monk. We're 20 years from that, which is to say that we're 40 years from a bitch's brew. <laughs> you know? So, you know, the, the Dizzy of, of, of hip hop may very well be just being born right now. There's definitely a, a, a few rappers that I think could be charged with murder. So, <laughs>